And so it wasn't until 2004 where I was, again, I had to, I had to rebuild that, that credibility with my chain sure. of command. Um, and, and I did so, uh, and it took me a year. And so in 2004, uh, I was, I was allowed to resubmit, uh, to go to, to the soft side of the house. Uh, I was, I was fortunately selected to do so. Nice. And so I made the official transition over to, um, support 10th special forces group in, uh, 2004. And, uh, and then I quit, I deployed not too long after that, uh, in 2005, back to Afghanistan. Uh, and I was with, uh, third special forces group, um, uh, 136 at the time. Okay. And we were at, uh, Shkin fire base again, down in the Southeast portion of Afghanistan, super small fire base, um, you know, about five kilometers from the border and, um, really great team. Um, super competent. Um, I, we, we didn't really get into a lot of stuff. Uh, it was just, again, a lot of kind of presence patrols some interdicting, you know, rat lines coming across the border, that sort of thing. You know, mm -hmm. we, we did have a couple, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell this story cause I think it's relevant, uh, to our community. Uh, when we talk about, you know, as a JTAC, you know, you, you the expectation is that you're a joint fires expert. And so right. joint fires uh, isn't just constrained to close air support um, from from aircraft, whether that's fixed wing or uh, close combat attack from rotary wing. It means that you need to be, you know, Johnny on the spot with any and all fire support options uh, that are available to you. So in our case there in 2005 at Shkin, we had a platoon of, of 105s there at our fire base. Nice. Uh, conventional guys from 82nd, they were awesome. Uh, highly competent uh, artillerymen, and so uh, I immediately, you know, built a very strong relationship with those guys. Uh, we rehearsed uh, fire missions, you know, if not daily, uh, no less than weekly cadence. Nice. Um, and so, and then we would, we we began to to uh, establish pre-planned targets uh, throughout our our AO. And so we were prepping for, we we're conducting a, like a three to four day uh, reconnaissance patrol along the border. And so we had done a lot of mission planning. Um, we were restricted at that time. I think it's, it might, you know, you, you couldn't, you couldn't bring uh, U.S. or coalition fixed wing aircraft within five nautical miles of the border. Right, There's right. just a buffer, right? And so obviously at that standoff at that time, uh, based on the, the targeting pods that most of the aircraft were, were carrying at the time, this is 2005, they were, they were limited. And so five nautical mile slant range at a given altitude, it, you're not getting a lot of fidelity, right, from, right. from the pods at that time. So cast aircraft in support of that particular mission wasn't necessarily, um, you know, worthy. Uh, obviously, yeah. if we were troops in contact, you could bust that buffer, but that's kind of the going in planning factor. And so with, with that in mind, like, okay, we, we need to have some artillery uh, support that's super dialed in. Uh, we need to have high levels of confidence. And we did so because of the, the level of rehearsal and training that we had done uh, prior. So, so we get out there, and uh, it's, it's myself, the team leader, and the senior uh, Bravo weapon sergeant. And we have our, our Indige uh, Afghan commando force with us. And, right. and we get up there, um, set up our OPs and, and everything the first night. And if you've ever worked with Indige Force, um, I, I love them all, but there's just a <laughs> lack of discipline a lot of times, yeah. Yeah. whether it's, it's light or noise or just general buffoonery. Yeah. And so, you know, they were making a lot of noise and, and whatnot. And, um, uh, we, the three Americans, we, we, we collectively made a decision We're like, man, this is, let's send these guys back to the MSS, which where the rest of our team was at with the vehicles yeah. about 5k away. Uh, so we made that decision the very next morning. So they head down the mountain back to the MSS. And so it's just, now it's just me, the team leader and the senior Bravo that remain behind. And as after they left the, the mountaintop, we were going to go hole up and uh, 
remain over day site. And as we were moving to that location, there were, there were two kids that came up the mountain and, uh, they didn't, in, they didn't let on that they, that they, they saw us, but I, I you could kind of tell it like they were, they were savvy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they got within probably, you know, 30 meters of us. And as soon as we saw them, we, you know, we stopped trying to you know get behind some rocks or whatever. Yeah. But as I look back on, I, I think they probably knew that we were there, but even though they didn't let on, they, they continued up the mountain, basically where our OP was the night before. Yeah. So fast forward, you know, to that evening and we're about 400 meters away from our previous OP the night before it had just gotten dark and, uh, the OP just about 400 meters above us, uh, just got lit up with heavy machine gun, uh, and RPG fire. And, and so there's just the three of us and we're like, okay, well, there's clearly, some dudes around us, uh, you know, conducting recon by fire, trying to find us. Right. And so now we're at this point, um, of, you know, about, you know, it's just three of us. Right. And so yeah. we're going to be outnumbered, uh, more than likely. So now we're starting to start to bound, bound our way back to our MSS, which is five K away. And, um, we were kind of down in the, in the valley. And so as we started to move back, uh, we started taking, there's a second element that was down in the valley with us that also started the reconnaissance by fire. And so now we, we definitely knew that we were outnumbered. And yeah. so we just started to, you know, expeditiously bound back. Uh, obviously we, we called the MSS, let them know what was going on. Yeah. And so they, they mounted up, started moving towards us uh, to try to close that gap as quickly as we could. So for me, right. So go back to the, um, the pre-planning. Uh, I, I had, our, we'd already set up all these pre-planned artillery targets <clears throat> around. Uh, and so I just started calling them up like, Hey, you know, fire alpha, alpha one zero zero three. Uh, and because we had done so much rehearsal, we had registered the guns and we had dialed those things in. But yeah. they, you know, artillery is not a, a precision weapon, but <laughs> no. we were, those guys were were on it, man. And so, nice. basically, you know, as as we bounded back, you know, I, I would call in uh, artillery, you know, at our previous locations and kind of cover our way out until we we got linked up with our MSS. So that's awesome. Uh, so that, that was, uh, I, sh I share that story again, because, you know, as JTAX or, you know, joint fires experts, like, uh, you know, make sure that, that you're using all the arrows in your quiver uh, right. and not just solely focusing on, on one or the other. And it's certainly, uh, I've seen this too. If, if you're not, humans are, are inherently lazy creatures. And so <laughs> if we're not really good at something, uh, most of the time we avoid doing those things. And yep. so... I've, I've seen this in our career field where, you know, guys, uh, for whatever reason, they, they're just not comfortable calling in artillery. So they tend to avoid that uh, competence. And so right. uh, that that's an example of not, you know, not trying to toot my own horn, but just I was using all the assets that we had available to us uh, in the most effective manner that I knew how. So in that no, particular yeah. case, it worked out. Yeah, I don't think that's tooting your own horn. I think that's that's good you know, solid planning. I mean, I think you, like you said, you used all the assets you had at your disposal. No aircraft were going to get close enough to do you any good right. in a timely manner, especially like that. But man, right. that's, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. You had those TRPs already set up and you just got to yep. call them in. You don't have to do any, as a matter of fact, you probably didn't have, even have to do really a call for fire or yeah. any kind of adjustment. I mean, you guys are bounding yeah. back anyway. That's awesome. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. It worked out. Worked out. Nice. Good, good deal. Yeah. So that, that was a good, um, that was a good deployment. Uh, uh, that deployment, here's the other thing I, I kind of saw in my career. It's like, uh, and go back to the Rambo analogy. Like you, you're, you're doing your thing. Uh, and, and you think that you're at that point I was with, you know, was it within special operations supporting army special forces? And I was like, man, this is awesome. Like, this is, this is the tip of the spear, man. And, and then you, you, you see other people, 
you see I, uh... other teams and you're like, man, who are those dudes? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you're like, well, how do I, how do I go? How do I get to become one of those guys or go be able to go do that? And, uh, so that deployment, uh, 2005, it was, it was, it was cool and it was weird at the same time. So, uh, I was in the gym one day working out in our, our prison gym and there's just this dude walks by, you know, long beard, all that sort of stuff. I'm like, man, that guy looks familiar. And so there was another team. Uh, there was an o- Omega on, on skin at the time. So um, yeah. I don't know if you want to go into what Omega teams are, but basically that, um, they're, they're teams that uh, within Joint Special Operations Command that, that uh, work with uh, other government agencies. Uh, yep. Let's leave it at that. And so uh, I went over to their compound, and I think I was asking them for if they had any old uh, drop zone surveys because th- that was another part of my duties and responsibilities was to to coordinate and control of our uh, airdrop resupplies, um, whether it's chow or 105 ammunition and so i went over there and to ask them if they had any dz surveys that at least i could reference uh before i I did a new one yeah and i go in there in their talk and and i see the same dude again and um and they were kind of standoffish you know they're but they were helping me out and um and i just asked them a question like hey man do you happen to be from uh did you ever live in missouri and as soon as I said that, we both kind of recognized each other. And it was oh, one man. of the, my my buddies from high school. What? Uh, Come on. Yeah. yeah that was, oh, uh, my God. So, yeah. So he was a SEAL. And um, and so immediately, like, dude, this is crazy, man. And so. <laughs> that is. Yeah. So it, it was kind of <laughs> cool to, you know, small world type of thing. No doubt. Uh, uh, but. You know, he, he was a part of that organization, and that was kind of my first time of, of really understanding that, man, there's different levels of this game. Right. Um, and, I'm, you know, and so that, that was intriguing to me. Yeah, and yeah. So, uh, so after that deployment, um, again, in 2005, I, I remained at, at 10th Group. Uh, I deployed again in 2007, early 2007 for the, the surge in Iraq, back to Iraq. So I was with, um, deployed with 10th group, but there was a, it was kind of a combination of, of 10th group. And I was with uh, Charlie one, one, which is uh, the first group uh, SIF team. Okay. Uh, they're in Baghdad. It was their first combat deployment um, to Iraq anyway. And so that was a great team, man. Uh, C11, uh, not just that company, but the team I was with was just was just phenomenal. Yeah, uh, super capable, proficient uh, SF guys. And so, now for those who don't know, go, say kind of describe what a SIF team does. Like what they're 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 SF, but they're they're not quite the highest level, but they're like up there. They're pretty they're pretty square. Like, what, how would you describe a SIF team or a SIF company? Yeah, so SIF. Um, so they, they call it the CRIF now, but back in the day it was called the SIF. So Commanders and Extremist Force. Now it's the yeah. Contingency Response Force, but change the name, the same sort of mission. So basically, if you have a um, a, a special forces group within that group, you're going to have it at one company specifically dedicated towards uh, immediate contingency response, uh, and predominantly so that they'll have. Uh, much more training in, in direct action and special reconnaissance yeah. and, and things like that. And so um, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say that they're better. It's just different in that they get more specially training. trained, maybe more than, specially trained. Right. Yeah. And like so, a green beret has a, a, a wide array of skills they have to maintain. Whereas right. like once they, if they get on a SIF team, it's more specialized, I guess. Is maybe right. What, exactly. Yeah, okay. And, and there's other courses that um, USASOC has, uh, you know, Sephardic being probably the the predominant ones that, that all mm-hmm. SIF, uh, SF guys go through uh, before being assigned to a yeah, SIF yeah. company. So obviously super squared away, switched on dudes, uh, highly competent uh, and proficient, uh, great leadership uh, from yeah. a team leader and team sergeant perspective. All the guys were just awesome. So I was... Uh, 
I was attached to those guys, but we had a uh, first group there. We had uh, a 10th group team there. And I think there's like four teams and we, and we were based out of Biop, So Baghdad international airport at the area four, which is the commando area for the Iraqi uh, counterterrorism force. And that was our partner force. Okay. Uh, both the Iraqi counterterrorism force and the Iraqi commandos. That was, those were our two partner forces. And so, Again, that was during the, the surge in 2007, which was pretty epic in terms yeah. of, you know, the gloves came back off and and uh, you, we were really able to apply the the level of lethality that the U.S. military is capable of, of doing. Yeah. And, and when we're able to do that, uh, we can we can achieve some pretty significant results quickly. Um, obviously, you know, we do so in a professional, ethical, moral manner, but sure. in terms of, you know, getting after it, um, like we, we were enabled to do that. And so much so that there were often times where we would, we would do, uh, two to three missions a night. Yeah. And, and that was, that, that pace was, was brutal. And cause yeah. it was, it was literally every night, um, uh, for, seven months and Jeez. that that there's there's there might be some folks out there saying oh it's bullshit i'm telling you man it was it was that pace and so yeah. the way that we we ran the cycle was you know there are two basically two week cycles so you're an operational cycle a training cycle with your partner force and then uh, a mission planning cycle right mm -hmm. so the teams would rotate through that cycle but again, go back to you're you're the El Solo Lobo Air Force JTAC. Right. Like you don't get you're not on that rotation. You're <laughs> you stay on operational rotation and you rotate through the teams. Yeah. And so there were there was several nights where uh, I'll give you an example. We 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 went out and conducted a half helicopter assault uh, with one team. We got we we touched back down at, at the compound. Uh, after that mission, go back into the, the jock. The other team was get, was mounting up for a gap, ground assault force into Baghdad, grabbed the mission products for that, got the stack from the, the FSO and the jock, and jumped in the truck with them and, and went and did that mission. So oh, that, that was an often time, often time recurring kind of battle rhythm. Um, there were, there were two combat controllers there as well. They were assigned to uh, two other teams, mm -hmm. uh, but it was just the just the three of us there, JTAX with uh, with that SIF company, and it was it was it was legit, man. It was it was busy, uh, but again, that's that's what that's what I wanted to do, man. And, right, uh, right. So I, I enjoyed it. I never felt like it was a, a burden, or uh, I didn't want to go. Like man, I was like. I want to go. Matter of fact, it's like a dream come night. true. Yeah. Like this is, yeah, this is what you wanted to do. So it wasn't like, yeah, uh, yeah like you said, it wasn't a, it wasn't hard to <laughs> pony up for that. So yeah. Uh, matter of fact, one night I, I got back from another half and one of the, my other teams that I, I typically would support was getting ready to go out. And one of the combat controllers uh, knew that I was still out. So, so he, he grabbed that mission and as soon as I walked in, I'm like, Hey man, where are you going? He's like, Oh, I'm going with this team. I'm like, no, dude, that's, that's my team. And <laughs> I, I appreciate you covering down, but uh, I got it, man. And so, uh, yeah, but the, it, again, the, the team mentality, uh, those guys sure. are great. Uh, it well, that's the thing. I mean, in, in people that are thinking like, uh, oh, you're just trying to do too much. The, the thing about those specialized teams like that, like that combat controller, was probably a squared away guy and he was just trying oh, yeah. to do you a favor because he didn't know if you're going to get back. But if you, if he would have been on that team, that team would have been like, who's this guy? Like, where's Brett? You know, he, Brett's our yeah. guy. We train with Brett. Now we got to figure out what this guy's, you know, if he'd be squared away. Yeah. It's just easier and it's, it's more, it's safer and more effective to have the same guy every time. That way they, you know, you're used to that kind of battle rhythm and that does TTPs and that kind of thing. Yeah, certainly. And, and, those guys, both those guys were super capable as well, and they would have done a phenomenal job. But to your point, it's like when you build that, that relationship with that team, 
uh, and, and you, you spend a lot of time and effort uh, building that credibility based on your performance and, and your deeds, not your words. Um, yeah. You know, it's, you know, there's that level of trust that, that's created sure. there. And uh, so, yeah, but, but certainly we were, uh, the three of us were, were self, you know, we would, we would help each other out as much sure, as we sure. could. So tell me about some, I mean, do any of those specific hits turn, uh, stand out in your mind? Uh, was there one particularly harrowing yeah. one or? Yeah, one was, uh, so this kind of touches on your uh, critical thinking and problem solving. So uh, again, there, there were three of us there assigned to, to that specific mission. Um, and we, we primarily operated in, in Baghdad. And if any, Anybody that was over there at the time remembers, you know, uh, 88 Alpha Sierra. That's the that was the one to 100 map of, of Baghdad. That's that was the kill box for Baghdad was 88 Alpha Sierra. Okay. And at the time, it was it was the most you know congested airspace in the world. I think uh, at least that's right. what I was told. And so what that meant was that uh, any time that we operated in Baghdad, like we had to be super switched on in terms of our airspace deconfliction oh, yeah. and and understanding where everybody was and uh so we what we devised was this internally was this kind of plan is like, okay uh this is where my target is this is where yours is this is where your yours is this is the ROS, the restricted operating zone that that accompanies each one of our our targets clearly they're going to overlap and mm -hmm. So how the, the question then becomes how do we deconflict, you know? Because I got I got five aircraft in support of my mission, you got three over there, and and he's got you know two over there, and so right. and and those are just the aircraft that we're controlling. All uh, right. Obviously, that there's there were other um, elements out there in Baghdad uh, doing their own thing that also had aircraft, mm -hmm. and so we had to uh, number one visually represent what those rosas look like on the imagery and we would do that in falcon view and then i, I typically print a, a hard copy with my cargo pocket and then we we also we obviously knew each other's strike frequencies and so if and when we we had to go kinetic uh and i and i would brief this in my my uh pre-mission brief to the aircraft i'm like hey man if, if we go kinetic I need your dash two to jump over on this strike freak, which is my teammates, the combat controllers, and and let him know that we need to clear out our rods in order to conduct this kinetic strike. Okay. Um, and so, you know, that's the way that, that we handled it at the tactical level. I know that, that the CRC also, you know, played a, a role in, in that stuff as well. But at the tactical level, in the heat of the moment, in a tick, like that's how we, we chose to solve that problem. And it worked out well, man. It was, it was very efficient. It was fast. Um, and so getting back to this one night, we were, we were doing this, uh, hitting all this compound to, to ca kill or capture this guy. And we had conducted a we, – we dismounted our vehicles about two blocks away, and we're walking – Round in the corner to the target building, and I'd have had F 16s overhead in support. And so they'd, I'd had, I pushed them over to the target area to start developing, you know, situational awareness of the target before we, we got there. They'd done that. They said, Hey, man, there's, there's eight dudes on the roof, um, look to be sleeping at this point. And so they kept eyes on them. Uh, we had rounded the corner, they started to stir. They get up and look over the, the side of the, the rooftop and, and immediately start engaging us. And uh, so I was lighting the, the F-16s up to, you know, to, to drop some ordnance on this building. And the, I'll never forget this, man. Lead comes up. He's like, he's like, I'm like, hey, troops in contact, you know, and we had our, our uh, graphic grid reference graphic products. I'm like, hey, you know, it's target building confirmed. Like, yep. Eight individuals rooftop target building. I see that they got weapon. I see their contact. Yeah. So basically, I was lining these these guys up to for a nine line uh, to drop ordnance on this on this target, right? Yeah, yeah. And then he said, "I, I got to go get gas." So oh no! Immediately after I told him that, uh, but I had also had an MQ1 Predator 
uh, overhead and support as well. And I was okay. also watching this unfold. And so I'm like, well, shit, I, let's, let's try a hellfire off this MQ one. And so as you can imagine, um, calm delays based on the distance and, and whatnot, it, it was, it was challenging to try to get whoever was flying that thing, right. uh, line lined up for a hellfire shot on this building. And there were some geometry problems involved with that based on altitude restrictions and launch acceptability regions of the hellfire and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And, and line of sight to the laser energy and, and all these different things. They just basically, he came in and he was off dry three separate times based on parameters. And finally I said, Hey dude, this isn't working. Uh, I, I popped over, I had him contact my combat control buddy who was in Baghdad, had the gunship. Actually, I, I didn't do that. I jumped on his frequency cause I knew the gunship was going to be on his frequency. Mm -hmm. told the gunship, Hey, I'm troops in contact on this operation. The other thing that we would do is we would all, we would give all of our mission products to all the aircraft that were going to support all three of us. Smart. So, so they already had them. So I'm like, Hey, I need you to come overhead, establish, you know, your, your wheel over target, this target on this mission. Uh, and so they did that. They got over, uh, quickly and we started putting rounds down on that target. Um, most of the buildings over there were, were, uh, reinforced concrete mm -hmm. rooftops and stuff. So by that time, the bad guys had gone internal to the structure. So in my mind, I, I want to mitigate collateral damage. Right. And so knowing that, uh, I'd been on a lot of rooftops at that point in Baghdad. So I knew the, the composition of, of what it was. So I was like, Hey, let's go with one Oh five delayed fuse. Let's, let's punch through. Let's you know, try to contain the effects inside of that, that sure. target building. Uh, and so we did that and, um, you know, we, we neutralized the, the, the target, um, didn't sustain any casualties, uh, reduced that structure to the ground. Um, nice. and then unintentionally, you know, set some fires. And, uh, so I had to answer for that once we got back to the, to the house and, and but again, this goes back to um, your your competence as a joint fires expert. Like you need to understand, you know, why you are doing something. And right. in, in my case, the why for because the first question is like, well, why'd you use 105? Like, you know, that's way above what you, you needed to use at the time. And I'm like, uh, actually, I used 105 in order to mitigate collateral damage. Right. Um, if I would have used 40. Number one, it's not going to do anything. Uh, it's not going to punch through reinforced concrete. Number two, the forty the the round forty rounds that they were using had the zirconium rings on them, so they were intended to start fires. Mm. And so um, that was. But if if you don't have that level of understanding and competence, then you, you can't, um, you know, you, you can't articulate clearly your decision making. Uh, right. And certainly you're going to put yourself behind the power curve in the moment in a, in a fairly dynamic situation, um, trying to achieve effects and, and uh, you know, save your teammates while also at the same time uh, reducing the enemy. So it was basically that turned into a, not an investigation, but it was just like had to talk the leadership through why. And, and so you, you need to be able to, for all the, the young dudes out there, Make sure you have a level of competence that enables you to, to, to do that when the time comes. Yeah, it's not about just killing bad guys. Sometimes you have to explain how and why you kill those bad right. guys. Yeah, especially right. in this day and age. Like at the beginning, not so much. But as the war went on, a lot of lawyers got involved. A lot of, you know, um, a lot of people had to answer for what they did. And if you are confident and you're doing the right thing, then you got nothing to worry about. So, yeah, keep that in mind yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes. So that deployment, uh, I, I still think that was my, my best deployment in terms of uh, ability to to control and employ munitions uh, and, and really do my do the job of a JTAC. Like yeah. a, just a, a lot of uh, 
closer support employment from from both fixed wing fighters, the gunship predominantly, a lot of critical thinking to to solve unique problems. Like some nights, uh, there just wasn't enough aircraft to go around, so there would be times when we didn't have anything. And it's like, well, do you just throw your hands up and say, well, I'm sorry, team, there's nothing I can do? No. Like you figure out, hey, what conventional Apache units are conducting area reconnaissance in the area that my operation is going to be conducted? Uh, how, how do I contact those guys, give them my frequency and build a relationship with them so that uh, when there is a gap in coverage based on, you know, refueling or, or whatever the case may be, I know that I can jump on on their common frequency uh, and and ask them to come over if, if they can to support those gaps in coverage. And so uh, we we did that. I did that several times, um, which was you know again they're more than happy to do it, right? Because they're just sure, kind sure. of cruising around, just looking for things. They'd rather be just supporting an active you know direct action mission. So. Right. Uh, but but those are the things that, you know, again, I would encourage you know the young guys out there to, you know, just don't stop at that first obstacle. Kind of, you know, think through creative solutions um, so that you're an asset to the team.